Oh, nice set of parries from this guy. That's what I. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, that was that was a nice. Oh, that was a nice overhead parry on my part. I just randomly press the blocking button every so often, just because I'm like, okay, so maybe I should be a little bit careful about these enemies. Uh, hello. Oh, get it. Oh no no no. Oh, am I dead? Hello and welcome back to our Sturgeon Viking Adventures and we are going to be attacking a lot of Azurai vassals in this episode or at the very least I will try to eliminate as many as I possibly can. Now we are just charging in with our cavalry here. I actually wanted to get a little bit of damage done on their cavalry because they sent their cavalry in and I was like, oh, okay, you're being a little bit uh, a little bit audacious here and you know, do want to make them pay for being so incredibly brazen. But it uh, doesn't seem like that's really paying off dividends here. I did make a brief stopover in Sionan to check out what kind of units I have in the garrison there. And it turned out that we actually did have a couple of shock troops a couple of uh, brigands, light cavalry, and so on. So I decided to take a number of those just to fill out our army a little bit so that I don't have to continually gain things from other factions. Although I think it does make quite a bit of sense to incorporate some Vlandian units over time, especially considering we are going to be eliminating them quite soon. Anyway, let's tell my people to uh, probably charge in at this point because let's face it, look at the combat strength. You can see the combat strength is considerably in our favor. No real reason for that, by the way, just literally because this person was in um, one of the Azrai armies, I believe, and we have now been able to sort of separate her from the main pack and as a result, boom, we now have an opportunity for murder, which is great. So what I'm actually going to be uh, talking about in this episode, very briefly, I know I say that. <laughs> I do say that and then I end up talking for 10 minutes. I apologize for that. It's, it's, a, it's a problem. It's a problem. I, I agree 100%. But anyway, what I'm going to be talking about is where my child is, because I think I only have one child, or a Seni's child, shall we say, and I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you how uh, that person is doing, because I actually don't know whether it's a whether it's a boy or a girl, to be honest, because um, I didn't, I couldn't really tell at the time. I'm not entirely sure why. Uh, I think it is a girl question mark I actually don't know but whatever the case our child is still alive and is still doing perfectly fine I just don't know what is actually happening with them it could be that um, we just need to speak to them a little bit and see what's going on you know just take a look at their stats and all that sort of stuff uh, I'm not really holding out too much hope in regards to how many stats I'm actually going to be gaining over the time of progression obviously if you've seen my small little update talking video about going over the changes giving you my opinion on the updates that will be coming to the other version, the more up-to-date version, shall we say, of Bannerlord, then you'll know that Tailworlds is actually thinking of incorporating a system known as education into the game. And that's basically making it so that you can have a more deterministic approach to your children. So you don't just have to rely on the father and mother's statistics you can more accurately determine what kind of character your child is going to end up like, which, in my opinion, is a very welcome change. So I'm very much looking forward to seeing what that's all about when I eventually update to the next version. Personally, I feel like all mods should work with all versions of the game. I know that that's really not possible because the modding people that make the mods, obviously, they have to make sure that it works for that particular version and then when or when the version gets updated then they also need to update the mod and so on and so forth but i wonder if there's a way that that can be done just that little bit easier i don't know whether it's that way with other games 
like, I don't know, Skyrim or New Vegas or some other kind of game that incorporates mods, when the game updates, does it also cause a little bit of a version problem and maybe some crashes here or there? I actually don't know. It's uh, been a long time since I've played Skyrim, so I really don't know. The only thing that I do know is that when you play a total conversion like Enderal, for example, you do need to have the correct version. <laughs> so maybe that is a big deal, but obviously that's a total conversion, which is pretty large and quite intricate and complex in comparison to just changing some random thing. But anyway, let's take a look at our clan here. So you can actually see this is, uh, it's a its a boy, right? Yes, that's why, I, uh, isn't it? No, no, I think because, I think because, it, it, I, I think because they have a ponytail, it is indeed a girl. So yes, me naming her uh, Rosival was probably not the best idea, but I guess, I, I guess that's okay because uh, technically Ros, you know, Ros is um, technically... Uh, kind of a feminine name, so why not? I think that seems like a pretty cool idea. All right. Well, it was technically in honor of her father because he fell in battle once again due to the Black Widow curse that we have so far seen. Technically, I can change their name if we want to. Uh, personally, I feel like it's quite poignant to leave it the way it is, so I'm pretty happy with that. Anyway, we're going to go into the party screen. I actually thought we had another companion, but apparently we don't. Okay, that's not too bad. All right. Ah, Talas. I would like to be able to speak to you, sir. Oh, yes. Come back here. Now, yeah, I, I thought I would return to the scene of the crime where all of these Azurai vassals were running around because I really very badly wanted to try and murder more of them. And that's exactly what we're doing here. I actually did not mean to press on leave. I meant to press on converse. I'm very much hoping we will be able to try and persuade him to 20% chance. Well, he seems to be a rather slippery customer. And indeed, 20% chance is not good enough. So I will just be attempting to maybe see if... We get a critical success on the last option, but it is highly unlikely. Yes, as you can see, done. Yeah, that's it. Um, personally, what I would like to see with the persuasion system as well is I'd like to see a bit of a revamp, basically making it maybe a little bit more likely that you're going to have the ability to try again in a shorter span of time or for them to give you additional options because as you could see there it's a bit weird how i only had one conversation option in the first um the first uh, round of persuasions i guess you could call it and i think that personally there should always be at least two because otherwise, if you're stuck with a 20% chance, it's basically already the nail in the coffin. And I think it removes a lot of the tension surrounding the whole persuasion thing. Because even though it is not necessarily the most intense of game mechanics, it does provide a lot of immersion and maybe a little bit of atmosphere as well. Because you, you kind of want to try your best to sort of see what happens and, and to get these guys to join you and obviously if you fail then that's kind of sad obviously but uh, in general i wouldn't say that the way that it works with that 20 percent chance it already gives me a sense of dread it's always it's already like okay well 20 percent chance probably never gonna happen you know i mean it has happened in the past by the way i have been able to persuade people with 20 percent chance but it is seldom going to happen very rare and uh yeah i, I would like to see more options in that regard and i'd also you know what i'd you know what i'd also like to see i'd also like to see the ability to if you're playing a somewhat dishonorable character like well quite obviously Iseni is at the moment because she is indeed a person that is executing pretty much everyone she comes across which is well 
uh, again, dependent on who you are and how you how you're looking at things, it is obviously in Bannerlord at the moment considered quite a dishonorable act. However, I would argue that again, it is very subjective. It really, very much depends on who you're executing and maybe maybe how, maybe uh, you know in what kind of circumstance you uh, came across them. You know, for example, if you're ambushing them and they're raiding a village and then you execute them for being a looter or something, I don't know, I mean, this is just an example, of course, then I would definitely say that you should gain honor for that because you are protecting the defenseless denizens of your realm. And while, of course, it is indeed a uh, rather viable strategy to cause economic damage in some respect or another, I feel like maybe it could be done in a different way so that they don't have to end up killing all of the villagers. And uh, as a result, I mean, obviously, the raid itself is indeed also a dishonorable act. So technically, if you raid a bunch of villagers, you're also going to get the red honor tag. In other words, a dishonorable tag. So, well... I don't know. It's a bit. Uh, it's a bit of uh, a bit complex. A bit complicated. Not entirely sure how to really balance that. But I just thought I'd open the discussion anyway. I'm not complaining about it or anything like that. It's just nice to talk about the game as it's in development still. And who knows? Maybe someone will have already suggested this on the forums or something like that. And then maybe the developers will listen and so on. And that would be pretty cool. But obviously, I have no idea how to actually implement these changes whatsoever, if they are indeed even any good. Because let's face it, I do throw around a lot of ideas, and some of them are pretty bad. You know, I mean, that is that is the nature of ideas. Sometimes they're going to be awful. Like unsliced bread. How awful. <laughs> uh, no. Well, you can, just take a, you, know, you can just take a knife and go slicey slicey, and I'm dead. <laughs> just like that just like that yeah okay uh, that was to be expected though of course because I did not have my shield up and let's face it the Azurai had a massive massive vantage point in the form of this small little mountainous hill here but um, yeah oh yeah also something I wanted to um, I wanted to mention I must apologize for in the previous episode I uh, said something that was incorrect, and uh, generally I tend not to give incorrect information, especially about basic unit types, but in this case I definitely did, and um, it was a, um, it, it was a, um, what was it now, a speculation on how many units the Azurai had, and I basically said that they had a lot of noble units in the form of Mamluk Heavy Cavalry. And now this is my bad, because I actually thought they were noble units, but they are in fact not. The vanguard unit of the Azurai, thanks to uh, one of you in the comments, by the way, for correcting me on this, because I did not actually know this. I thought the Mamluks were the nobles, because they're so strong, I just thought that they were indeed the nobles, but they are not. The vanguard Faris is indeed the noble unit and we now get an opportunity to take her prisoner and uh, that actually gives me a, uh, a a pretty nice shall we say overall picture of how strong Azurai armies are now going to be because you can see here that they have a pretty significant amount of heavy cavalry of course in my opinion they are a very strong unit and definitely Definitely something to be avoided, potentially, if you don't have an army that is capable of countering them specifically by having a lot of crossbowmen or something along those lines. But at least now I can look out for those Faris archetype units, and then I can basically be like, oh, okay, they got a bunch of nobles, probably want to get out of there. But these guys actually don't. As you can see right here, they have 82 Mamluk Heavy Cavalry, which, uh, again, as I previously thought, they were noble units. That's pretty insane. But they're not. They have two 
as far as I can see here. Yes, they have two noble units. They are still going to be quite dangerous, so they will definitely be someone that I will be running away from relatively fast. Although, now here's the thing, I could stay nearby and just wait and see what happens. Now, what I would like to do is try to persuade Desporion to join us, potentially. Of course, I do have a very small amount of HP right now, and I definitely do not want to get into a battle with that very large army. That would be a pretty big catastrophe on our part, but thankfully we're able to avoid that for now. And here we go. Nice. 68% chance for the critical success. Seems like the uh, the changes to persuasion have, have very much... Um, well, altered the way that I and many others, no doubt, will be playing the game from now on. I know a lot of people were actually complaining about the persuasion, which is, in my opinion, quite a shame because I personally found it quite fun to be able to persuade and base your gameplay on persuasion and on trade and stuff like that. But obviously now it's much more difficult. All right. So let me actually just take a quick look here. What do we want to go for? Well, a Garantor Castle. I am going to be giving him Garantor Castle, I think. I have no idea where Tubalus Castle is. Can I see that? Um, I might be able to go through here and see it this way. Yes, there we go. Ah, it is indeed an Azerai town. So that is very far away. Yeah, that is very far away. So I am actually going to say no to Tubalus. Actually, should I even bother? Because what I could do is I could literally just give him huge amounts of money. What about if I release these? No. See, as I say, releasing prisoners makes no difference to them for some reason. It should, but it doesn't. Ah. Oh, he's cheap. Look at him. Look at that. 1.17 million. He only has... Uh, oh, that's the reason why he's cheap. He only has 110,000 in cash. That obviously makes a huge difference. All right, I'm going to be taking both of those things. Thank you very much. He's going to be joining me, and those castles are now no longer his. Oh, yes, perfect. All right, so as you can see, we now have Veron Castle, which is actually what I was attempting to besiege before I even started this episode. And then those vassals descended upon me, and I was like, okay, mm, should probably fight them instead. And so now... We have, where's, where's Tubalus Castle? Because that was one that we just gained from that particular deal and I cannot see it. For the life of me, I cannot see it. Is it somewhere down here? There it is. Ah, very sneakily hidden away next to that town. This is actually a pretty cool location because it does allow us to go from Sargoth or from well, anywhere around here, really. Go over to Garantor Castle and then into Tubalus Castle. I think that's pretty cool, but it definitely is not the best in terms of strategic um, strategic value. So what we're going to do now is I would like, if at all possible, to go down to Ortizia, maybe call for an army and see if we can potentially take it. I think that that would probably be the best use of our time. Desporion and his friends can indeed now join me as well, which is going to result in a rather strong army. They do have relatively good amounts of units, I think. Something we should really also take into account is that when we do uh, some of these uh, persuasion attempts and indeed, uh, you know, backroom deals and stuff like that, where we are actually able to gain a, a fee for two, it really makes a huge difference to the overall distraction of that thief, you know, because right now, over... Over at Tubalus Castle, there is a, uh, a siege going on. Yes, there's a siege going on by one of the Azurai armies. And that Azurai army is going to be significantly drained of resources. And we're talking about time. We're talking about troops. And we're also, of course, talking about cohesion and food supplies. That is probably the best possible stoppage we could get to the opponent with the exception of obviously going 
and capturing all of them and then executing them. Now, of course, don't don't worry. We're going to be getting into some very large battles very, very soon indeed. But I just wanted to make sure that we had a little bit more of a consolidated area surrounding Garantor Castle especially and also connecting the trade route of Lagata and Ortizia together. That would, in my opinion, provide quite a lot of value and security to those caravans. Obviously, I'm not really running too many caravans at the moment, but there are huge amounts of NPC-run caravans around here, and I'd like to be able to assure their security just that little bit more because obviously as it stands right now i don't really have the ability to run you know run a huge amount of those so what we're going to do is we're now just going to be placing our cohesion and and uh, increasing it as much as we possibly can now this is a bit problematic as you can see these guys have just literally been building catapults catapults are as i've said before in my opinion far and away not the best when it comes to uh actual siege defense oh hello wait a minute oh dear okay now this is problematic this is wait a minute did he take he didn't take anything okay well that's fine then that is absolutely fine. All right, I am pleased. Okay, so yeah, we did have a clan leave the faction just now, but thankfully, I had foreseen this by previous experience and being burned by that multiple times <laughs> over and over again, so that I basically did not vote for this guy whatsoever when providing him with the possibility of getting any fiefs. So that's great, because that means that we, now we don't lose any fiefs and we gained his assistance for a pretty significant amount of time in the meantime, in the meantime that he was a member of our faction. So I'm pretty happy with that. Now, let's get in. Let's get into the walls and see what we can do. Oh, they have a lot, okay, yeah. So I've already taken a look, by the way, at the garrison in this area, and uh, they have 50 Ah, oh dear. Yes, they have 50 Imperial Sergeant Crossbowmen. I just think 30 blunt damage to the arm. I think that's a bit too much in my opinion, but well, whatever. You know, I got hit, so I'm going to take it. Okay, wait a minute. Oh, this, this is problematic. Uh, get, uh, no, okay, apparently not, apparently not. Okay, yeah, let's just, let's just hit a shield. Oh, okay. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's, it's kind of weird how they're using one-handed weapons. I would have expected them to use mostly two-handed right here because they are indeed spearmen, but obviously most factions do have that. Getting a little bit of a frame rate problem there. It's more than likely because of the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, because of the wonderful, wonderful spawn-ins of the enemy, because they are indeed losing units so fast, and we have seen in the past that spawn-ins do generally tend to give quite a lot of slowdown, because they do not see fit to spawn them far away from the action. Don't know whether you've noticed that, but they, uh, the developers have made it so that their spawn point is pretty much right by the side of us which for a defensive effort is definitely going to be much more advantageous to the enemy but it is making the optimization and the performance of the game a little bit lackluster as a result i feel like spawning them in front of the player like this is gonna probably result to be kind of harsh on performance and uh, oh yeah by the way thanks to those of you in the comments that did actually um, let me know that the optimization in the um, future version that I will be, of course, updating to at some point is not that progressed in comparison to what I mentioned in previous episodes. So thank you very much for letting me know about that because I'm always wondering about it because some of the time I might miss it. Some of the time I might not uh, see those kinds of changes in the change log and... I am very interested about that kind of stuff because having a game that can run consistently at, well, dependent on what you want, you know, if you want it to run at 30, then you can have it run at 30. If you want it to run at 60, then obviously 60 and so on, dependent on what kind of settings, what kind of setup you have. And um, indeed, I think it would actually be a very cool idea for the developers to add 
that kind of accessibility to the game as well, where you can basically run on any FPS. So if you want to lock the game to a certain frame rate, then I think there should be... I think there is? Isn't there an option that does that? I'm actually not sure. It's been a huge amount of time since I've gone into the graphics settings. So I will definitely be doing that at some point just to see what's going on with those options because if there is indeed an option where you can lock the game to 30 fps and then get a consistently smooth experience so it never goes below 30 then i think that's a pretty cool idea but of course every in my opinion every game should be able to run at 60 because that is the standard for refresh rates in monitors unless you're of course a uh, uh, well hardcore gamer uh, and you have a 144 hertz monitor or 120 hertz or something like that but in general i don't think banner lord is going to be able to reach that unless you're on the world map or unless you're running around a very small battle so there's that oh oh a nice set of parries from this guy that's what i oh Wait a minute. Oh, that was so, that was a nice oh, oh, that was a nice overhead parry on my part. I just randomly pressed the blocking button every so often just because I'm like, okay, so maybe I should be a little bit careful about these enemies. Uh, hello. Oh. Get it. Oh no, no, no. Oh, am I dead? Am I dead? I might be. Oh, there we go. Whew. Okay, that was close. Oh dear. Well, th this is bad. Up the stairs, up the stairs, up the stairs, up the stairs. Let's go. Okay. Ah. Uh, can I jump down from here and not die? No, that's not that's not the case. Oh, there's there's more enemies across the way there. Okay, that might be a bit problematic. Let's not go over there then. And it seems like we are having some more reinforcements coming in as well. That was actually hilarious and actually kind of intense. I was not anticipating what? What is this? What is that? That's a broken texture. That is a broken texture, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. And I'm gonna die. <laughs> I was so shocked by the broken texture, I just thought to myself, I will end it all now. Yes, I will end it all in the name of broken textures. Okay, so, oh, there you go. Anyway, 116 deaths, actually kind of, uh, kind of serious amount of losses right there, but that is what happens when you start to run out of your best units that you've had for quite some time because obviously as you could no doubt tell in previous episodes over the last you know five ten episodes or so i've had a pretty strong army but now that my huskars are starting to diminish we are starting to have more and more problems and uh, i'm going to have to continue replacing these guys with regular units as well so in other words sturgeon shock troops and uh, brigands and marauders and so on and uh, they're not going to be as strong, obviously. That is to be expected. Anyway, we do have a very significant marketplace. Oh, yes. Look at that. 38,000 almost immediately off the bat. And I'm also hoping that we'll be able to get another 60,000 from them too. Now, obviously, I have a super hardcore amount of money, so I really don't even have to worry about money any further. And generally, I would say that unless there is a significant vassal, like, for example, Karith. I know that someone actually mentioned Karith. And, um, yeah, he, in my opinion, he is the most loyal vassal, at least to me. I've always seen him be really loyal. But obviously, the personalities, as far as I'm aware, they do get a little i think they do get a little randomized every single time i think so don't quote me on that because that's what used to happen in warband where the personalities were assigned randomly most of the time but obviously sometimes there are those staples that will always betray you and staples that will always be warmongers and so on and so forth so that does tend to happen. But there you go. We have now taken this and consolidated our territory even further, which I very much appreciate. And what's going on here? Vladiv Castle was taken by the Southern Empire. That's a weird place for the Southern Empire to be, isn't it? Maybe the Southern Empire actually had a defector leave us and take Vladiv Castle with them. That would be pretty awful, wouldn't it? Yes, it would be. Anyway, I think what I might like to do now is actually head down into Azerai territory and we can vote for the new owner here. So I will be taking this for myself, if you can believe it, because here's the thing. If I can take as many fiefs for myself as possible, and this is the point, I'm not doing this for cash because obviously, as you can see, I literally have more than enough cash to do with whatever I want. 
but the main reason why I'm doing it is for possible persuasive efforts. In other words, if I come across someone that I really, really want to get persuaded into our faction because they're just so powerful or we have a good reason to do so, you know, to prevent them maybe from forming a massive army because we're aware that they have a decent amount of influence, something along those lines, then I can use this town as a bargaining chip. And that's the kind of thing that I'd like to go for here. So anyway, we're just going to be taking her prisoner. Oh, we have a bunch of other prisoners as well. We should really just execute all of them. Thank you. And there we go. Yes. Very nice. And that is indeed that. Okay, so let's take all the loot and then we'll head on to Azurai territory. I did disband the army because I was too slow to catch up to this particular vassal, but I can, of course, call them back any time. But I think what we're going to be doing now is ending this episode off here. If you enjoyed the video, then please leave a like. I thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.